We're joined by Daniel House from uh, Gopher Guru. Daniel, how are you doing today? Doing well. Big Ten football's back. Last time we were speculating when we were together, and now we actually have Big Ten schedule 3.0. Exactly, 3.0. So if I recall, <laughs> Daniel, our conversations, I believe our last conversation, we were in limbo, but we were optimistic. And then things actually turned for the worse uh, in regards to all the speculation. And obviously the clock was ticking uh, toward, OK, we're boxing ourselves into not being able to play a fall season. And then all of a sudden, whatever that magic pill was, the push from the parents, the players, the fan bases, uh, the medical data and the procedures that were put in place becoming um, more acceptable to the safety guidelines, all of that factoring in to, yes, football on the field. That's what most of the people listening care about. And we've got a Minnesota game against Michigan, which is a very intriguing one coming up in just three weeks. Three weeks. Everyone's excited because the Twins just extended their playoff losing streak to 18 games. The Vikings are 0-3. The Gophers are the king in town for the first time in a long time. So uh, with that big Little Brown Jug game first week, Jim Harbaugh versus P.J. Fleck, uh, everyone is excited about it. Excited about that. Excited about who's going to be lining up at the wide receiver position who had opted out even before, I believe, the season was officially canceled. Yes. Yeah, he was one of the first guys to opt out. He didn't like the uncertainty of everything, and the Big Ten really didn't have a lot of answers on what the testing protocols were going to look like. So he decided to sign with an agent and declare for the NFL draft. Now, usually the NCAA, when you declare for the draft and you sign with an agent, you're ruled ineligible. But there was a little bit of an exemption there, past precedent with Arizona punter Michael Turk being able to get his eligibility back after going through the whole draft process, going undrafted. They decided that COVID-19 was a special circumstance due to the pro days being canceled and things like that. They thought it affected his stock. So Rashad Bateman, it was interesting. P.J. Fleck, the minute he heard the news that the Big Ten was coming back, formal announcement, he called Rashad Bateman. And I he's bet like, he I, <laughs> I, I, he said it was not a recruiting pitch. He was calling him just to say, hey, if you're interested and you want to come back, I fully support exploring it. Let me know what you want to do. He asked him, is it worth it to you? You could come back and, you know, go for four or five weeks and not be able to get your eligibility back. He said, is it worth it? And he said, it's worth it, coach. I want to come back. And I just think it speaks to Rashad Bateman and the type of person he is because he didn't need to come back for himself. He's probably going to be, you know, first round pick conversation type of player. One of the top receivers in the draft class. He didn't need to do it for Rashad Bateman. He's coming back for his teammates. He sees what this team can do, the type of special season that could be on the horizon. And if he does have a big year, he's on a stage that's bigger. Uh, he could continue to improve his draft stock even higher than it already is. And Gopher's offense is just changed now. Everything changes because Rashad Bateman's back. 60 catches, 11 touchdowns. Not a whole lot of guys walking around that uh, have produced those kind of numbers in the Big Ten. Uh, and, and basically Micah Parsons has decided uh, to continue to opt out and prepare for the NFL draft at Penn State, one of the best linebackers in the country. But other than that, uh, most of the guys that come to mind as the big name, Big Ten players, Rondell Moore at Purdue, Wyatt Davis, Sean Wade at Ohio State coming back and wanting to play football despite um, being very highly regarded and their draft stock being... Um, pretty secure regardless of whether they would suit up this fall. So it speaks a lot again to the team unity and how much these guys are loyal to their universities. Yeah. And Rashad Bateman has been loyal to PJ Fleck from the beginning. I mean, they went to a satellite camp in 2017, the Gophers coaching staff and PJ Fleck fly down to Georgia, watch a satellite camp. They go, look at this kid, Rashad Bateman didn't have a lot of offers at that point. And then all of a sudden, after the, the practice is done and, and the showcasing of his talent uh, finished up, P.J. Fleck offered him on the spot and he committed. Then he had a big year and he started to get some buzz from SEC programs, including in-state Georgia and Kirby Smart. And he said, I am not wavering from my commitment to Minnesota. I want to help P.J. Fleck build this thing. So I look at it as he has stuck with P.J. Fleck in that instance. Now he could have went to the NFL draft early, but he wants to finish what he started with his teammates. And I wrote an article about it on Gophers Guru talking about the whole process that led into this and PJ Flex call with Rashad Bateman, 
all the way to the point where now reaching the decision from the NCA to come back. Rashad, I, I've covered Rashad for the past couple of seasons and just seeing how much he's growing. You know, he's this quiet guy coming in, didn't say much, but then now he's become a vocal leader and he's he's a really great interview. Uh, Rashad is a big part of this team. He's a foundational guy in PJ Flux culture. And to have him back, it's not only huge for the football team on the field, but off of it, you see now he's going to wear number zero this season. He's changing from 13 to zero because he wants to show people there's zero tolerance for racism uh, in society and in Minnesota's culture. So he's using his platform to bring about social change. And, and I think that's just something that is really unique about Rashad. That was my next question, Daniel, where the, uh, the, the number change came from. So that's amazing that he's, um, that he's promoting that. Certainly, uh, we got Daniel House on the line. You can see right there on the banner, gopherguru.com. Daniel's joined us about a dozen times here at Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. And you can see the obvious uh, insight and information and perspective on Minnesota football as PJ Fleck and company prepare for another run of the Big Ten Western Division Championship. So I don't know who's happier about the Bateman news, whether that would be PJ Fleck or that would be Tanner Morgan. So, so he's got his number one guy back after throwing 30 touchdowns and seven picks, uh, starting with Morgan, the rest of the offense, maybe even the backup quarterback situation, because they're obviously only one play away, uh, just set up the offense in regards to what we saw in 2019 and what uh, it could look like this fall. Well, you just look at Tanner last season, top five in passing efficiency. This could be a year where Tanner makes a big leap and starts to gain a lot of NFL draft buzz. You look at the strides that he's made this offseason with his personal kinesiologist, Rob Williams, just tuning up the mechanics and getting things where they need to be there. I see the Gophers offense with Rashad Bateman coming back. Uh, you see Brevin Span Ford, the tight end, is a guy to watch. Gophers didn't throw to the tight end much under Kirk Shiraka, but Mike Sanford as the new co-offensive coordinator, he is going to incorporate the tight ends more, flex them out. We saw that at Utah State pretty frequently. And then dating back to his time at Boise State, Notre Dame, uh, in Utah State, he has used the running backs in the passing game. So you could see some more screens for Mohamed Ibrahim, things like that. Uh, I, I'm really interested to see how the offense comes together. I think it's a three-headed monster with Bateman, Brevin, and Bell. It sounds like a law office, but that's the three, the trio of guys that offensively is exciting. And you look at the offensive line as well. There's a lot of returning continuity there. John Michael Schmitz, a young player, could turn into one of the top centers in the Big Ten. Blaze Andres is back. Sam Schluter is back. Uh, they have a lot of talent on their offensive line and versatility. So the continuity offensively, I think, is is extremely intriguing. The killer bees, uh, that term's been used just, just once or twice in the past. I don't <laughs> know if they want to go with that, but uh, it's, it's right there for the taking. So, Daniel, you alluded to Mike Sanford taking over the offense. Uh, Trevor yep. uh, commenting here uh, into the chat, uh, just wanting to know what your thoughts are in regards to maybe some wrinkles or some changes that uh, could be the footprint of what uh, uh, Mr. Sanford brings to the offense? It's a really good question. I believe it's co-offensive coordinator with Mike Sanford and Matt Simon. So you're going to see the framework of the offense, the RPO game that was so strong last year, the inside and outside zone rushing scheme. A lot of people think Mike Sanford isn't a huge balance type of guy between the run and the pass, but he foundationally loves to run the football and that's kind of the center of everything. I believe the biggest difference is going to be the vertical concepts. They're going to take some more shots downfield, creative route concepts. Uh, he's a big coach in terms of QB movement and designs, uh, and that's going to be something that helps Tanner Morgan out a lot. Like I said, the tight ends, the running backs, they're going to be more involved. It's going to be a blend of the two perspectives, taking some of the things that Matt Simon learned under Kirk Shiraka and the other staff as well that's still there, and they're going to mesh it together. It's kind of like the – second version of the Gophers offense with new wrinkles and, and things that they've done in the past. I, I can't wait to see uh, what it exactly looks like. Got Daniel House on the line, Gopher Guru. Uh, head on over there to gopherguru.com. Daniel doing an outstanding job of covering Minnesota football as uh, the Gophers tee it up against Michigan, which is probably the spotlight game of the Big Ten schedule on October 24th. That, that should tell us a whole lot right out of the gate. Uh, with those two on the field, Daniel. 
Yeah, I look at Michigan, 125th in returning production coming back uh, this season. Their offensive line, you look at Runyon, Bredesen, Amenwu, uh, Cesar Ruiz, all gone. Jalen Mayfield luckily got the uh, NCAA waiver to come back, so he started 13 games at right tackle last year. But what happens with the offensive line, the left tackle spot with Ryan Hayes? Uh, he's a redshirt sophomore. He's going to be making his third official start in the first game. Uh, I look at Boye Mafe as a guy that could break out for the Gophers this year. I did a piece on gophersguru.com looking at the testing metrics, and I encourage everyone to go check it out because his NFL comparison is scary. This guy is like a historic athletic profile in terms of players that have uh, been in the college football ranks, especially in the Big Ten Conference. So Boye Mafe that week, Asezi Odomueo, another guy on the edge. I think the Gophers' pass rush could be the biggest difference this year. They have to get better rushing with four. They blitzed on about a quarter of their snaps last year and generated pe- pressure on about 55% of those blitzes. I went through and charted all the plays. But the biggest thing is they had about 11.8% havoc rate, which is 93rd nationally. So that's tackles for losses. That's creating sacks. Uh, and and havoc plays just in general. So the biggest thing is you got to be able to create pressure with four rushers to do creative things with your coverage. And Gophers have question marks on defense. I, I, there's no doubting that. 33% of the returning production back. 100. That's 125th out of 130 FBS programs. So losing Antoine Winfield Jr., Kamal Martin, Carter Coughlin, Chris Williamson, Sam Renner, an underrated three technique defensive tackle. They're going to be relying on guys like Mariano Sori Marin at linebacker, Tyler Newman, one of the top players in the previous class at the safety position. Boy Mafe, I mentioned him, Keontae Shad, a three technique defensive tackle. Who's the nickel cornerback? You see uh, Chris Williamson departing. In Joe Rossi's defense, you have to have a player who's solid with run fits. Uh, to be able to play in the nickel spot. So I look at Justice Harris, experienced guy on special teams. He's probably the leading candidate to get the nickel job right now. But what about Jalen Glaze, a young player, Solomon Brown? Those are a couple names to watch with all the uncertainty on defense and limited practice time. Uh, The training camp schedule looked a lot different. How is defensive coordinator Joe Rossi going to get all these guys uh, to come together and develop and mesh and adjust the scheme? Uh, I'm excited to see that as well. I am definitely going to have you back on here, Daniel, not just to talk about the Gophers, but you started talking advanced metrics. I can tell that you are, pardon the term, because I've told, I've said this about myself, a nerd when it comes to stats and the advanced metrics. And obviously the old stats only tell us so much, but to dive into the advanced metrics that really uh, can tell us how good players and teams are, uh, it's really interesting stuff. But uh, we will, we will table that for another time, but we want to get a look at the uh, Minnesota defense before we move on to t- talk some Texas football. Uh, your thoughts about the Gophers and where those concerns are and what's being addressed probably right now in practice. Yeah, like I said, the front four is the big thing. 16 of the Gophers, 28 sacks were the result of blitzes. So you have to get pressure on the quarterback consistently with your front four. You watch the game against Iowa last year. They brought a lot of blitz pressure in the second half, and that altered the timing of the throws with Nate Stanley. And they kind of took the game plan approach. You're going to rush with four, you're going to drop in the back and play a lot of coverage. And that strategy didn't go as well because Nate Stanley was able to pick them apart in the quick passing game. So when you start playing teams like Iowa and Wisconsin, you have to be able to get pressure on the quarterback with four guys and then time up your blitzes on third down. So I believe that, The defensive line and the front seven is the big focus. And then finding out how Tyler Newbin's going to play in Antoine Winfield Jr.'s role. I mean, you're seeing what Antoine Winfield Jr. is doing. uh, Defensive rookie of the month right now. I think anybody who watched the Gophers last season could have told you that was going to happen. This guy's instincts are incredible. He did a lot of things in the back end of that defense and made adjustments. And it's just the guy that you have to scheme for. So losing him is going to be the X-factor type of thing for the Gophers. They have to find a way for Tyler Newbin to slide in there. He's a very versatile player, super athletic, got some experience on special teams, but he's going to be thrown into the fire. And Mark, I think it comes back to the Big Ten right now. We don't know when the season starts what the quality of play is going to look like with the limited contact, no fans in the stands. I'm expecting it's going to take a while for some of these teams to get going, and I won't be surprised if there's some upsets and we have some strange football games early on in the season. It's going to be interesting to watch. 
Yeah, consider Texas. Uh, we're going to be talking Longhorns in just a minute. Seventeen point favorite taken to overtime. LSU sixteen point favorite on Saturday. Lost that game. We could go on down the line each and every week. Uh, double digit favorites going down already with a with a limited schedule with only about sixty percent of the teams on the field. Yeah, and you're seeing it across college football, like you said right now. And my my question is, what is the offensive? firepower going to look like when the Big Ten comes back because with no crowd noise, I think you're seeing in the NFL being able to make pre-snap adjustments, communicate at a higher level. Is scoring going to be elevated? Uh, it, it, there's so many things to look at this year. I wish we, you know, I want to get fans back in the stands, but in a sense, I'd love to be able to have a bigger sample size to quantify the impact of home field advantage because there's definitely environments in the Big Ten where that's huge. And like when Minnesota goes to Wisconsin this year, is it a big difference because there aren't fans in the stands? I mean, it, it, it probably is. I know that Vegas was initially taking some kind of educated guess to pare that down from a three-point advantage, and it depends on the circumstance, obviously. Uh, UTEP's home field advantage versus Death Valley at LSU are two different deals. But a, a general three-point um, advantage there to like a point and a half, according to the um the handicappers that I talk to. So I don't know if they've seen any kind of trends just through the limited sample size that we've seen thus far. Uh, GopherGuru.com. Daniel comes on here and you hear the obvious insight into Minnesota and the Big Ten and college football in general. So please head on over there because um, uh, the work that he does is phenomenal. Daniel, thank you so much for stopping by. Maybe we can uh, uh, track you down right before the Michigan game. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I'd love to come on. The excitement's high, and, and we're looking forward to the season. Appreciate it. Have thanks. a good day, Daniel. You too.